Hello and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I am recording this intro the week prior to his actual release, and with all that is happening in our country, there's no telling what's going to happen when this podcast episode actually releases. You know, there is so much division in our world and really our country, and I'm hoping things get better, but I guess you can't just hope. So I'm just trying to figure out what actions I can take to contribute to being part of the solution and not the problem. You know, I've had episodes about inclusion and diversity and kind of talking about it, but I think trying to figure out what, again, what actions I need to take to help contribute to more tolerance, not just tolerance, I really hate that word anyway, to acceptance and justice and peace for us all. So I say all this just to acknowledge what's going on, to acknowledge that people are hurting, and to hope we can find some way to anything better than what we are, we're in right now. Now, on a personal note, we have landed back in Gulf Shores, Alabama. We have our RV in a park, in an RV park, and we are trying to get organized and fit what used to be our house. (laughs) We're fitting our life into now an an RV, which if you look at the picture, it looks giant, but it's a small space with two kids and two adults and a dog. So we, I don't know what we were thinking because when we packed up the kids, they're like, here's your two buckets of toys. Like, come on. Now that we see the space, it's just not possible. And uh, we'll be living in it for the next three months, six months, very possibly a year. I don't know. We're kind of keeping it loose. Um, We may be living in it for a while. So we need to get this thing organized before we head out west. So stay tuned for updates. Who knows where I'm going to record an intro from next? I think about two weeks we'll be heading out. Maybe I should make a a game out of it instead of where's Waldo. Maybe it's like, where's Jen? So uh, stay tuned. Now, in our very divided country, there's never been a better time to talk about something that can hopefully bring us together. And today I talked to Mike Robbins. Mike Robbins is the author of five books, including his brand new title, We're All in This Together, Creating a Team Culture of High Performance, Trust, and Belonging, which released on April 21st. For the past 20 years, Mike's been a sought-after speaker and consultant who delivers keynotes and seminars for some of the top organizations in the world. His clients include Google, Wells Fargo, Microsoft, eBay, LinkedIn, etc., etc., And he and his work have been featured in the New York Times and the Harvard Business Review, as well as NPR and ABC News. He's a regular contributor to Forbes, hosts a weekly podcast, and Mike's books have been translated into 15 different languages. When Mike and I recorded this, it was at least a month ago, if not more than that, but it was when Corona was the big news of the day. Many of you are working to bring employees back to work, or maybe you're going back yourself. In this interview, Mike tells us a bit about his background in both professional sports and in the tech world and how they both got him curious about what drives success and fulfillment. We talk about the impetus for his writing his fifth and most recent book, We're All in This Together, which he titled Before the Global Pandemic Happened. Mike explains how to use the phrase, we're all in this together without sounding trite. And he takes us through the four pillars of successful teams that are listed in his book. I'm so thankful he put it through the lens of leaders building and strengthening teams during COVID, like when people are managing teams in the time of COVID and potentially bringing back to work. And then, of course, he leaves us with a tangible tip. Now, before we dive into the interview, let me tell you about today's sponsor. Now, before we dive in, I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, University of Wisconsin Health and Wellness Management, offering online bachelor's and master's degrees in wellness management. You can visit hwm.wisconsin.edu for more information. The graduates of the program have launched successful wellness careers with healthcare systems, wellness program vendors, community agencies, insurance providers, even the military. Here are some really cool things about UW Health and Wellness Management. One, courses are designed and taught by distinguished faculty from the University of Wisconsin, many of whom actively work in the field, which in my opinion is a big plus. Secondly, UW Health and Wellness Management is also supported by an advisory board, industry experts from corporations such as Children's Wisconsin, 
Willis Towers Watson, and the Wisconsin Department of Employee Trust Funds, who offer advice on changing trends in health and wellness so that students are learning the most up-to-date methods. And third, students often say the flexible online format is a big factor in their ability to earn a degree. And let's talk about our recent situation. It's an indication of the advantages of online learning. Now, although the program is online, you will definitely make strong connections with peers and faculty, just as you would on campus. Let me read you this quote from a recent graduate of the master's program. For a class project and research methods for wellness programs, our team had six people working in three time zones across four states. Each student's career path was different. As a result, everyone brought a unique perspective to the project. Clinical, legal, advocacy, policy, and governmental. It made the project so interesting. UW Health and Wellness Management Bachelor's and Master's Degrees provides the skills you need to manage comprehensive employee well-being programs that foster healthier lifestyles and promote the value of staying well. Turn your passion for wellness into a healthy career with University of Wisconsin Health and Wellness Management. Visit hwm.wisconsin.edu or contact an enrollment advisor by phone at 1-877-895-3276. All of this will be linked up in the show notes. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview with Mike Robbins. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Mike, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on today. No, oh, thanks, Jen. I'm glad to be here. Now, your book, your newest book, We're mm-hmm. All in This Together, very familiar now, is, is about building teamwork. Yes. And we're going to get to some of the universal qualities that you have, but I want to get a little bit to your background. You have a really interesting one. You know, you've worked with large companies, just to yep. you know, name drop a little, Wells Fargo, Gap, Google. Mm-hmm. But I'm most curious about your background as a professional baseball player and, and yeah. how that has shaped your way, like really of thinking about teamwork and leadership. Uh, Well, quite a bit. And in fact, it has an intersection actually towards the end of my baseball career that connects with, I think, where you used to live in the uh, Raleigh-Durham area. But I basically, I grew up in California in the Bay Area where I still live. I played baseball all as a kid growing up. I actually got drafted right out of high school by the New York Yankees. Didn't end up signing with the Yankees when I got drafted out of high school because I got a chance to play baseball in college at Stanford. So I went to Stanford and then... uh, got drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals. And I did sign a pro contract at that time and went into the minor leagues as you do in pro baseball and um, was working my way up, trying to get to the major leagues. I was a left-handed pitcher. And my third season, I was pitching in the Carolina League for the Wilmington Blue Rocks. And we were playing one night against the Durham Bulls. And I went out to pitch against the Bulls and I threw one pitch. I tore ligaments in my elbow Mm -hmm. and I blew my arm out. It was the summer of 1997. I was 23 years old. I ended up having three surgeries over the next two years, did everything I possibly could to try to come back, but I wasn't, uh, wasn't able to make it back and was forced to retire from baseball at the age of 25. Um, super disappointing as you can imagine. I mean, devastating. I had, you know, started when I was seven and that was my, I mean, even though I'd gone to college and it was like, you know, the concept of like, you have to have a backup plan and this might not work out. And you <laughs> Whoever <injured>. thinks that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, I was smart enough and aware enough to know like, this is hard. You got to be good. You got to be lucky. You got to stay healthy and all this thing. But I didn't really have a plan. I didn't know what the heck else I would do. And so I was forced to try to figure that out at, uh, you know, 25 years old which, you know, a lot of people in their early twenties are still trying to figure out what the heck they want to do, but not that many people are so like sort of maniacally focused from the age of seven, like I was, um, on doing something. And I was pretty good at it. And there was a path that, you know, I was on to try to get to where I wanted to go. So it was, um, hard and painful and challenging, but ultimately, you know, an incredible life lesson and so many learnings. And in a very practical way, there was the like, well, I got to get a job. So I came home and it was, you know, the late nineties, I get a job uh, in the tech world during the dot-com boom 
time here in you know the San Francisco Silicon Valley area where I live. Um, and one of the things, Jen, that I had I'd been fascinated by a couple of things as an athlete. I mean, I love baseball, so I was fascinated with the game itself. But but I was fascinated on a human level. How come not? It wasn't always the most talented people were the most successful. And it wasn't always the most successful, quote unquote, people that were the happiest and the most fulfilled. So I was like, what's up with that? Like, how do you take any talent that you might have, whether it's in baseball or anything else, right? And turn it into success? Because it's not a straight line. There's other aspects involved in that. And then if you have any success, how do you actually enjoy and appreciate the success and, and, and then allow that to be fulfilling? And those weren't any; those weren't things I'd learned in school or in sports or in anything. So I was sort of curious about that. And then on a team level, I was also fascinated by the idea that I'd learned as an athlete through many experiences, starting way back in little league, all the way through college and playing professionally. That it wasn't always the teams that had the best players that were the best teams. I mean, having good players and good talent was clearly important. But I was on some teams sometimes where we had really good talent but the team wasn't very good because, you know, there were like egos or the coach was a jerk or, you know, whatever. It just didn't work. And then I was on some other teams where things kind of clicked and it was like, yeah, we got some pretty good players, but man, we have this awesome team chemistry. And it was like, we could beat other teams that had better players than we did. And I thought that was really cool, but I erroneously thought that was a sports thing. And then I get into the business world. I get my first job in the tech world and I'm like, oh, that's not a sports thing. That's a human thing. We just call it culture and business. It's the same intangible thing that's hard to define, but like mm-hmm. drives not only the performance of the team, but like how we feel in relationship to the other people on the team and just our overall sense of joy or lack thereof in the work that we do. So that got me really interested. And I spent a couple of years working for a few different tech companies in the late 90s into 2000. And then the NASDAQ crashed in 2000 and the dot com bubble burst. and I lost my job, which was kind of a bummer, but also kind of a blessing in disguise because it ultimately opened the door for me to start my consulting business, which I've had for almost 20 years now. And I just wanted to learn more about that whole, how do you take your talent and turn it into success? And how do you, if you have any success, how do you actually figure out how to be fulfilled? And then also how do teams really come together and create that kind of chemistry or culture that's necessary? And so that's really what I've been studying and writing about and speaking about and teaching and coaching people on for the last almost two decades. Wow. I've got got a lot there to ask you. I mean, good for you for being curious of just looking at those connections. And I've never made yeah. the connection. Like I, I played high school soccer. Like, so it's, I was, mm. I was a high school athlete. Uh, yeah. it is, it's funny now that you're talking about that team. Like we had a great JV team. Like we all right. loved it. We were winning. The coach was awesome. Then I got to, to varsity and it just wasn't the same. Like yeah. it just, I've never connected those. I was like, I, I really don't enjoy this. The coach is a yeah. jerk and <laughs> yeah. you know, everyone's just kind of not gelling. And I've had the same experience in corporate life whenever I had mm-hmm. a team of, I've run a few teams and one, we just got along really well and the other one, not mm-hmm. so much. So um, when you had that second blow, when you, when the, the you know bubble burst mm-hmm. and you got let go, did you see it as an opportunity then or as a blessing then? Or were you like, oh crap, man, again? Like, is this well, happening again? It, a little bit. I mean, I wasn't as emotionally attached to it and it wasn't like, you know, I'd been doing it for a couple years um, had a little success the first year and a half at my first company, went to a second company with the idea that like, hey, this is a startup, it's going to go public, we're all going to get rich. That was kind of happening a lot in that time and with a lot of people my age. So it seemed like, and I, I was bummed of the lost opportunity because in that in my mind at that time, it was like, oh, I missed the window or what's happening. And, and I got laid off in July of, tw- of 2000, which was a couple months before everybody started getting laid off. So there was a little bit of shame and embarrassment and more also just practical fear of like, how am I going to pay the bills and what am I going to do? And, um, but I didn't feel the same sense of, uh, you know, disappointment and devastation because I, I didn't really love what I was doing. Um, I was curious about it and, and interested in some of the aspects, but I didn't think I wanted to sell internet advertising for the rest of my career. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah. more, and the truth was what ended up happening to me. I had a mentor of mine right around that same time, ask me this really simple, but profound question. He said, Mike, if you could do anything and you didn't have to worry about paying the bills and you weren't worried about, you know, just sort of your, your needs being met on that front, like, what would you do? And I said, well, 
I would write and I would speak and I would try to coach people, inspire people, you know, and, and he said, Oh, and I was, he's like, you seem really clear. You should do that now. And I'm like, now, which is, I'm, I'm 26 and like, how the hell, I don't know anything and nobody knows. I mean, don't you have to have some kind of degree or credential or something? You know, I was like, and he's like, well, look, you could go back to school and you could figure it out or you could do this or that other thing. But the truth is like, it's really going to be a matter of if you have the courage to just jump in and start doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you. And so, you know, that, and then once I did get laid off and I was in that process, I was sort of half-heartedly looking for a job. But there were no jobs to be found at that time, especially for people my age in the city where I was living. And, you know, everyone was just like laying people off. I mean, in some ways, very different circumstances, obviously, but it's like trying to go look for a job right now, not the easiest thing to do. It's not that nobody's hiring. There's a few places, a few industries and a few companies that are hiring like crazy. And then there's all these industries and companies that are, you know, shut down or closed for the time being and, and laying people off. But ultimately... And again, I did get advice, go back to school, get a degree in psychology or in organizational development or, you know, and I love to learn, Jen, but I never loved school. Yeah. And I was a good student, but I sort of did it in order to, like, I wanted to go to college and have an opportunity to play baseball in college at a good school. So that was why I did well in school. But like, once I got to college, I didn't really care that much about the education, quite frankly. I mean, I went to class and I paid attention, but did I didn't. what you needed to do. Well, yeah, to me, it never felt like, again, I was more curious in some of these things about like, how can I be more successful? How can I be more fulfilled? How can I, you know, engage more effectively in relationships? And I, and I wasn't, there weren't any classes on that from what I could see. So I just went to class and like went through the motions and, you know, was smart enough that I could pay attention. I mean, kind of anno- like my wife thinks it's kind of annoying. Like I was never a big reader. I'm still not a big reader. Ironically, you know, my daughters joke sometimes that I've written more books than I've read. Um, <laughs> But I'm an auditor. I learned later in life, I'm an auditory right. learner. So I, so sitting down to read a book is challenging for the way that I process information and the way my brain works. Mm-hmm. But if, mm-hmm. if I listen, like if I listen to your podcast, I can get a lot of information from listening to you talk or your guest talk or so, or so I listen to a book on audio. It's awesome for me. I don't have to see anything. I mean, it's nice if I do get to see something, but that's the way that I process information. And so I say that because it's like, I didn't want to, so I could go to class in college and l- go to section and listen to the discussion and take the test on the book and do fine without reading the book, which yeah. was kind of annoying to that the people who, who read the whole book, right? It's like my girlfriend in college used to get really annoyed with me because every now and then I'd be like, tell me a little bit about the book and she'd tell me, and then we go take the test and I do really well. And she's like, I'm not telling you about the book anymore. I'm going <laughs> to do your freaking homework. And I'm like, look, I'm not trying to cheat. It's literally like, I'm not going to read that thing because it'll either take me like three weeks and the test is next week, or I'm just, I'm not going to remember it. Yeah. You're not going to retain it. What's the point? No. And it was, it felt like a waste of time and energy. And it wasn't that I was just trying to skirt around it. It's like, I wish I would have known. And in fact, if there were, and there probably were more access to audiobooks and things at the time, I could have done that, but I didn't know. So I just sort of, you know, made, anyway, that, that's a long way of me saying I didn't want to go back to school and get a degree. I would have done it if I had to, but I just decided, you know what, I'm going to start this business when I did in 2001. And I said, I'm going to give myself a year. I'm going to what I called it was design my own curriculum, which meant listen to whatever I could listen to. I did do a little bit of reading, but it was more meet people who were doing this kind of work. And in 2001, I mean, it's, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but it was like a different world in terms of coaching, in terms of like the, the mm-hmm. work that you do on wellness and well-being. Like there wasn't a ton of that, especially in the business world. There were, there was limited numbers of things that people were doing around kind of personal and professional development that they were actually, and I was interested. I mean, I wasn't just doing it to make money, but I was like, I want to do this for a living. I don't want to do this as a hobby. So I also want to talk to people who are helping other people and actually making money. And I didn't, I wasn't attached to doing it in the corporate world. That just kind of happened Mm -hmm. that people in businesses, I started giving talks at like rotary clubs in any random place that I could. Mm -hmm. And people would come up to me and say, you know, my team is really struggling with this, or I have this group. Or at the time there were a bunch of Gen Xers like me who were now had gotten laid off from the internet world and were now getting jobs at more traditional companies like Wells Fargo and Chevron and Kaiser and these companies that were based in the Bay Area where I lived. And I was getting invited in to come give talks about teamwork and how do Gen Xers and baby boomers work together, which I didn't have any real expertise in generational differences, but like I had a little bit of self-awareness and I thought I could speak to some of this stuff because I knew my own experience. 
and relating to people a little bit older than me didn't seem that challenging. It's like, we got to listen to each other. We got to like learn from each other, like, you know? So it just started to evolve and my, my approach and my message started to resonate with a lot of these companies. And then I realized again, in a really practical way, like there's people in these companies, <laughs> these companies have money, they have a need and I have something that I could potentially offer. Plus as, as, a, as a young guy with no following, I mean, in those days there was no social media, there were no podcasts, there was no, you had to like write a book and get on Oprah or something for people to know who the heck you were. So I was like, well, these people don't have to know who I am. Just one person has to believe that I have something of value to say that I could offer and then invite me in. And then I got a chance to be in front of people and, and make a difference for them and also make a living doing it. So, I mean, it was pretty lean in those early years, but that's really how I got started. I didn't write my first book. I started my business in 01. My first book, Focus on the Good Stuff, came out in 07. So 20 years later, and you're in your fifth book, <laughs> 20-ish, 19-ish. Yeah. I mean, so like, look, I have friends who write books every year. I have other friends who've been doing it for 20 years who've never written a book. And it's just like, I don't know how the heck I've written five books, quite frankly, because I mean, I love the work that I do. The writing part, always the most challenging for me. Yeah. And I have that, that feeling that I want to write a book, but I don't really want to. Like, I like the idea of it, but the work of it. <laughs> No, not so oh, much. Oh, listen. Yeah. Well, listen, I love, I love having written the writing process. Not my favorite. Just, just so you know, for whatever yeah. it's worth. Well, there's a reason we do podcasts, right? Instead of totally. blog posts and stuff like that. Like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Really we can have a conversation. Podcast. Well, the funny thing is though, but, but this book, so this fifth book, we're all in this together is like kind of a culmination of my work over the last 20 years, but it actually came on the heels I wrote my fourth book, Bring Your Whole Self to Work, came out in 2018 and I was done for a while. Like, I'm like, I'm good. Four or five more years, maybe if I have, I get another inspiration, I'll write another book. But like three weeks after Bring Your Whole Self to Work came out, I had this huge like download of like this next book I'm supposed to write. And I was literally like, you, if you saw me on the street, Jen, you would have thought I was a crazy person because I was like talking to myself. I'm like, nope, nope, I'm not writing another book. And I'm like having this weird conversation with the air of like wherever this message was coming from. You have to write another book now. It needs to come out in 2020 and it needs to be called We're All in This Together. And I was Wait, like, anyway, if I'm not mistaken, Mike, it had to do with the 2016 election. And well, it had yeah. to do with like that kind of in, like gave you. It, 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 it did. It did. I mean, look, part of what had happened for me in 2016 with the election, like a lot of people, you know, whatever your politics are. I mean, I followed the election pretty closely. It didn't go the way that I wanted it to go, nor the way I expected it to go. And then it just became. It to, apparent to me, like our country has been incredibly divided for a long time. And, and I'm aware of that. I mean, I live in California. I live on the West Coast. I live in a very sort of liberal part of the country. And I travel around the country and I travel to other places that the demographics and the, po- the sort of larger sort of political views are much more conservative. I'm always been fascinated by and interested in engaging with people who disagree with me. Like in life, I just find that fat. I, well, yes and no. I mean, I come from a family of debaters and like, let's sort of mix it up and chop it up and it's good and healthy to sort of disagree. And, um, and I also grew up in a really diverse city of Oakland. Um, you know, I'm white, I'm straight, I'm male. I, but, but most of the kids I went to school with, especially by junior high and high school, didn't look like me. And I found that really interesting and at times a little unsettling and scary and uncomfortable, but mostly fascinating. And so I've always just been curious and interested. And then What's concerned me in the last decade or so, and it just seems to be kind of getting to more of a fever pitch, is this intensity of the tribalism in our culture, in our country, and the inability to communicate and connect with each other when we disagree. Again, to the point where it's like, and I under, I mean, I'm not saying this is holier than that way. It's like, I like to just talk in my own little echo chamber with people who agree with me too, but it's dangerous. And it's like, that's not how we actually make things better. I don't think there's anyone in our country right now or anywhere in the world that says, you know what I think is a good idea is if we all really hate each other. Like, <laughs> that's a really good idea. I think that's good for our sustainable health and well being and the, the goodness of our country and the world we live. No, I don't. I mean, now people have strong opinions about how the country should be and where we should be going and what's right and what's wrong. I get all that, but at some level, so I started writing a little bit about this and podcasting a bit about it. And there was seemed to be a lot of energy around, you know, some of these issues. So that's part of, you know, why for me, I wrote Bring Your Whole Self to Work, but I didn't get into a lot of it in the book, but was finding I was starting to talk more and write more about it, but was a little nervous about it. But then this download was like, no, you need to double click on some of the stuff you talked about and Bring Your Whole Self to Work and really talk about it more directly. And this book needs to come out in 2020 before the election. Because part of it, the book itself is about creating a team culture of high performance, trust, and belonging. 
but there's a deeper message in it from my perspective of like wanting to remind myself and all of us, Hey, you know what? Yeah, we're all really different and we have different views and opinions and backgrounds, but like we're way more alike than we are different. And one of the paradoxes of great teams, Jen, is that like you get a diverse team, it's going to help, right? Different backgrounds, different perspectives, different skills, different opinions. You want a team of people that like they're willing to challenge each other, bump up against each other and not all look the same and think the same and act the same. Yet at the same time, great teams understand the importance of diversity and simultaneously understand the importance of really eliminating that sense of us versus them within the team. Mm -hmm. Because if that's the case, the team can't thrive. If we're competing against each other as a team or even trying to impress Mm -hmm. each other as a team, we can't perform well together. And every great team that I've ever been on or worked with, at some point in their journey of being a team, something clicks and they move past and realize, you know what, there is no them. It's all us. Right. So that in versus out group, you've got to have right. that. Everyone's in the same group. And totally. I, I love the background of we're all in this together that had nothing to do with coronavirus. <laughs> well, but, but here's the, the, the one thing though that's funny about it is that I'd never been so adamant. I mean, I didn't really want to write the book. I'm like, I'm busy. I'm tired. I don't really want to write another book, but I feel like I'm supposed to, I have to. So there was that push. And then I pitched it and my agent and my personal editor, and then my editor at the publishing, all the kind of key people involved in the process, they all said yes to the book, but they all said no to the title. They yeah. said, we, we love the book. We, well, it, they wanted to be called The Keys to Creating a Championship Team, which is a program that I have literally delivered as a speech or as a workshop for 20 years. The first speech I ever got paid to deliver back in 2001 was called The Keys to Creating a Championship Team. And it's evolved, obviously, over the last 20 years, but that is a fundamental, the fifth principle of my book, Bring Your Whole Self to Work, is create a championship team. As a former athlete, a former baseball player, I often talk about teamwork as the sense of creating a championship team. It doesn't mean you win every game. It doesn't mean you never lose. It means you put the team above the individuals and it's right. And while I have no problem with that phrase, I have no problem with that concept. That's really what the book is about at its core in terms of the content. I was like, no, this title is important to me to the point where I'm not going to write this book now and we're definitely not going to publish it now if we can't use this title. And I had to fight, which I normally am not that way about things, but I dug my heels in and said, it's either this title or no book. And everyone finally acquiesced. And then, mm-hmm. and then the book was scheduled to come out this spring and the pandemic hits. And the book's not about that. I mean, I finished writing it last late last summer and we finished all the edits in the fall and but now I'm turning on the news back in March and everybody from the president to the presidential candidates to people on TV, on the news networks, to celebrities, to like to advertisers. I'm getting all these emails in my inbox from all these companies that I'm, you know, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. Well, and it's like the, it's super bizarre because like people are texting me all day going, Hey man, your book. It's like, I keep hearing people say the title and I'm like, they're not talking about my book just so you know, but but so again, it's, ta- it's taken on this whole other sort of meaning because, and I think I, I started out like, why are people saying this? And I, I think what it is, is when we're dealing with something big and something challenging like this, that obviously we've never dealt with before. I think we know intuitively, right? Okay. I can't get through this thing by myself. And in fact, we collectively really need to, I mean, ironically, we're all separated <laughs> physically. Mm-hmm. But what we really need to do is metaphorically kind of lock arms with each other and reach out to each other and hold on to each other and say, you know what? The only way we're going to get through this thing is together. So, so Mike, let's, let's talk about that title because I think, I mean, you must've known something that that you (laughs) foreshadowed this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's still, your book is relevant. I know a lot of, a lot of people publish books at this time and it just doesn't seem relevant. So at least it's very relevant. Um, You know, one of the things I think organizations have been feeling is the rift between the essential worker and the non-essential worker. Right. So some employees are still going in every day and then other workers are at home because they have to be. They're trying to, you know, stay safe. And sometimes if we say we're all in this together, it can seem very trite to the people, right? So what do you recommend for that situation? I want to get into your four pillars in a minute, but... Well, look, I think it's important because at some level, I mean, I had an executive for one of our clients a few months back. I was on a Zoom call with them and it was right after everything and everyone was starting to stay at home and right 
was all happening fast and, and companies were having to make really tough decisions. What do we do and how do we do this? And who's essential and who's not essential? And do we furlough people? Do we reduce people's salaries? Do we lay people off? Like, how are we going to get through this as a business? And look, companies are still dealing with this and we don't know how this thing ends. So it's really hard. And one of the executives says to me, Hey, Mike, we got to make some really tough decisions. And then we have to put out some really difficult communication. How do we communicate to our employees that we're all in this together? When in truth, we're not all in this together because some people are going to get laid off. Mm. And I was like, uh, I don't know. That's hard. That's a good question. And, and part of what I started to think about and what I ultimately said to him and to them, and as I've been thinking through this, is like my thinking on this has evolved a bit in the sense that understanding and knowing as human beings we're in this experience together. And as companies, I do like the metaphor, and, and you people listening have probably seen this or heard this. It went around social media a while back, but this notion that we're not in the same boat, we're in the same storm. Yep. And right, I like that idea. And again, not, it. Not, mm-hmm. but, it, but the idea is that like, look, your boat and my boat are going to be different. And the truth is, right, your, your life and your job and your family and like everything, and we could know each other really well. We could work for the same company but the truth is based on what you do and how you do it and the viability of your role relative to the, the bottom line of the company. This is true like back when I was playing baseball. Like everyone's equal on, in the sense of we're all equally valuable as human beings, but not everybody's equally valuable to the team. That's just a reality of life, right? It's mm-hmm. like I was watching a while back the Michael Jordan documentary on ESPN. And yes. it's like Michael Jordan was more, <laughs> was more important to the Chicago Bulls than anybody else on the Bulls. Right. It, they couldn't have won the championships without everybody, but you take Michael Jordan out of the mix and the whole thing is over. So like he's more important than even Scottie Pippen or Phil Jackson or the rest of the guys that played for the Bulls during those six championships. And I think everybody understands that the same is true in business. It's like certain people and certain roles are more important and more essential. That doesn't mean people are more intrinsically valuable as human beings. So it's a it's an important distinction to understand. I can have empathy. I can understand, I can be mindful, and then I still have to make difficult decisions based on the viability of the business. And so this back to this boat and storm thing, it's like understanding that most of us have a certain level of privilege in life that we can be grateful for in the midst of this pandemic. That doesn't mean things are super easy for any of us, but the reality is, and I'm able to acknowledge there's some stress and challenge in my life with my business, with my family, some stuff that's not that easy or fun that I'm personally dealing with right now. And I also know that simultaneously, I'm incredibly blessed Mm -hmm. and fortunate to be able to do what I do in the way that I do it and have the situation that I have. And I think emotionally, that's hard for most of us to hold in general in life, but especially right now, because there's so much pain and there's so much suffering and there's so much loss going on that I think it's hard for us to navigate this emotional terrain because most of us have never had to deal with anything quite like this. No, no, we never have been through a global pandemic before. Right. And I think it is it is really tough. And, yeah. it, it, and for employees to be able to have that emotional intelligence right now, and they don't always have it when, you know, when we're under stress, but right. like, when you just said valuable, that's part of what I'm preaching is how can you bring the most value right now? Like right. it's not the time to sit back and wait. It's the time no. to step up and figure out how you can support the business. And for the employees who are kind of, you know, losing their stuff at this time, it's like, yeah. if there are layoffs, you'll be the first to go. I mean, I hate to be that harsh about it, but that, you know, if you're going to well, it, cause chaos during it. It's true. I mean, I look, I think of this in, from a sports context. Again, I mean, one of the things that I learned, look, I was a pretty good athlete, but as I got further along, Jen, it became abundantly clear to me that like, I wasn't the strongest. I wasn't the biggest. I wasn't the most talented. I didn't have the most money invested in me. Like, again, nobody was trying to mess with me. Nobody was out to get me, but I knew, okay, look, man, if you're going to make it to the big leagues, you're going to have to work really hard. You're going to have to make sure you don't get in trouble. You're going to have to be the best possible team player you can be. And all of those things, I, I felt those things and meant those things from a very genuine place in me because I wanted to be all those things. But there was also a very practical part of me that's like, look, if I get myself in trouble, if I do something stupid, if I'm causing problems for the team, you know what? They're not going to put up with that in general, but especially for me. You know, and I think, again, we have to have some self-awareness of our level, our level of skill and the, and the level of value that we bring in any given moment. And it changes. It's not personal, but I think about this even with my clients now. It's like the value that I bring to my clients, I still believe in it really strongly. But what the companies that I partner with right now that we work with, what are they able to do? 
What are they able to pay? What are they looking for? How can I adjust the world that we lived in right. three, three to six months ago is a very different world than we live in right now. And so again, it's like, even as someone who's not looking at it from an employee perspective, but someone who's looking at it as a partner perspective, how do I bring the most value to our clients in a way that really serves them at this moment and is mindful and respectful to the moment that they're going through, not simply just self-serving and like, I got to keep my business going and I want to pay my employees, which I do by the way, right. <laughs> but that can't be the primary motivation that I have when I'm interacting with my clients because my clients don't really care about whatever revenue I'm generating or that my company's generating and being able to play, pay my employees. They're focused on their own goals and their own employees, which well, they should be. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the beauty of us being in our own business. It's like, we know that we can get cut in any second and that we yep. have to provide value and we have to embrace and shift. Totally. And although like in the corporate world, you can get by with kind of, I'm just saying, being a slacker for a while. Right. <laughs> especially when, like this, you just can't, you're not well, going to be able to, to do that. Well, and especially when things are going well, right? When, yeah. I mean, things are going well, the business is doing well, the economy's booming, the unemployment rates down, the stock market's up, all the factors that were, that existed. And it's like, hey, I can just kind of coast through this. And again, I'm not, look, a lot of people listening aren't in that category at all. But I think a lot of us, look, we're never quite as good as we think we are when things are going really well. And we're never nearly as bad as we think we are when things are going really poorly. Again, coming back to sports, it's like the team's winning. We're on a winning streak. Everything's going well. People are playing well. Now all of a sudden we get really caught up in, aren't we awesome? And then it's like, yeah, and then we hit a stretch where we start losing and then everything goes down. The, well, we probably weren't as good as we thought we were when we were on fire and we're probably not as bad as we are while we're in this losing streak. It's somewhere in the middle. And, and that's one of the many things that I'm grateful for, not, having, not only having been an athlete, but specifically played baseball. Because baseball, some people listening might hate baseball because it's a little slow and boring. I get it. But, but, <laughs> it's, her, huh? but it's, 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 a, it's a marathon. There's 162 games in the Major League Baseball season, a normal regular season. Last year, the team that won the World Series in baseball, the Washington Nationals, they lost 69 games during the regular season. They lost another five during the postseason. They lost 41% of their games and they won game seven of the World Series on the road in Houston to be deemed the champion of the season, the best team in baseball. And they lost a ton of games. Right. So it's like, how do we all do? And this is where your work comes in really, it's really important, right? Resilience. How do I care for myself mm -hmm. physically, mentally, emotionally? How do I care for the people around me? Because the truth of the matter is not just when we're in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, this is an intense moment where we have to focus on these things and it's right up in our face, but all the time. I mean, again, without being cliched or minimizing the challenge of this, I mean, one of the many blessings and silver linings for me with this thing is it's like, had me slow down and really pay attention to a bunch of unhealthy, ridiculous things I was doing before all this happened that I wasn't even paying attention to because like I was just busy doing my life like the rest just of us busy. Yeah. and things were going pretty well. And I was just keeping up with it. And it wasn't like I was completely unaware, like, yeah, there's certain patterns here. I should probably adjust. And then also there's been some things in the midst of this pandemic, quite frankly, that like, oh yeah, now I'm doing some really even worse, unhealthy things that I need to like, <laughs> what the hell? Like it's harder for me. I don't know about you or anyone else listening, but like <laughs> my eating patterns and my sleeping patterns and my exercise patterns and things like I'm Fi trying to find a rhythm and a routine and a groove with it, but it's, it's, I'm finding it a lot more challenging right. and some people are finding it less challenging. But again, that goes back Just to it. like, we're in different yeah. boats in yeah. the same storm. Not everybody's in the pantry late at night, like I am, but many people but are. Most people are. <laughs> <laughs> and throughout the day. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, cause, yeah. It, it, yes. <laughs> well, one thing I want to make sure we, we get to is yes. I want to walk through the four pillars of your book. Okay. And I want yes. to, but let's put it through the lens in the context of employees coming back into the workplace because that's yes. what employers are dealing with now and probably right. will be by the time this this airs. Yes. So walk walk us through how teams or, or I guess leaders really can create this this thriving team right. in spite of with corona happening. Right. Well, the first pillar is to is really to create psychological safety. And psychological safety is basically group trust. It means the group, the team is safe enough for what? for me to speak up, me to disagree, take a risk, fail, even not that I want to, but I know that I won't get shamed, ridiculed metaphorically, or even practically kicked out of the group for simply having a different opinion or trying something that doesn't work. And, you know, during this time, it's challenging when people are working from home, but not impossible. It's, it's challenging as we come back into work and look, things have changed significantly. They're going to be altered in some way for quite a while. We don't know how long, but like, 
I, I don't see things going back to quote unquote normal for a heck of a long time. Right. So therefore what we need to figure out is like psychological safety is also somewhat connected to just physical safety. Do I feel, phys- when I feel physically unsafe, we think about Maslow's hierarchy. If we feel physically unsafe, nothing else really matters. Quite frankly, we can't right, even hardly you- pay attention to anything else. Right. Which has been, it's just, that's so weird in itself, right? Because right. it's been so long since we haven't felt physically safe. And that's a totally. good one just to bring that reminder back that people and, aren't feeling physically safe. And in some ways, I mean, I'm talking to a lot of people right now who are in this place of like, we want to get back to normal. We want to get back to work, but I actually feel safer working from home. And I'd rather just work from home. I'd rather, as much as people have Zoom fatigue, I'd rather sit on Zoom than have to go into the office if I can and put a mask on and gloves and stand away from people and see people, but not really touch. I mean, the whole thing is like, I'm even for me personally, like I just go to the grocery store and I usually have to like take some time to decompress from that experience when I come home. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, Oh, I feel much better just being at home at the house or in my office doing stuff. But when I have to go out into the world, it's more challenging. So again, but creating psychological safety in general, and especially, especially during COVID, I think is just being that much more mindful for leaders and for teams being authentic, being real with ourselves and real with each other. So is it okay to open up the conversation? Because what I'm imagining is, as we've talked about many times, and I do love the same storm, different boats, but that's going to be the situation going into it, right? A leader is going to have all of these different boats coming into their their back to work or even working from home. So is it okay to start that conversation about how was it for you? How is it for you? Is that an important step to building that psychological safety? I think so. And I Absolutely. And I think, look, I mean, on the one hand, I think there's a way we can, and I'm talking to some teams and some groups, even right now that are feeling sort of, you know, (laughs) Corona fatigue in the sense of, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Can we just not, you know, and so you have to just sort of meet people where they are. And I think as people start coming back to work in different ways, not only talking about how it was for them, which is important, but how is it for you right now? What do you need so that you can feel physically, psychologically, and emotionally safe? And every leader needs to know what that is for every single person on their team. And ideally for all of us as team members, the more we know about that for the people on our teams, the better. And look, is that hard? Yeah. Is that some like mental, emotional labor that we have to do with each other? It is. And look, the thing about this time right now is it's just going to be, it's requiring much more of us on every level. Mm -hmm. And I think at some level, the more we can surrender to that, the better. Like this is not normal. This is not going to be normal for a long time. And it doesn't mean it has to be terrible. It doesn't mean we have to be victims of it. It doesn't mean we have to suffer through it. But it does mean this is really requiring. I mean, look, just think about you at home with your kids at the ages they are, and even us with ours, and our kids are a little bit older. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I was going to have to run my business completely (laughs) virtually and homeschool my kids and figure out how to do all these things and like manage all this stuff that was just like, what? If you told any, if any of us had told anyone else this story six months ago, said you know it's going to happen in 2020, even like you're no. uh, you're crazy, right? <laughs> There's no way to explain this in any way that anyone could really grasp and understand. But the reality is, this moment is requiring so much more of all of us, and so for the team to be strong, we need even more psychological safety. And the challenge of it is that it seems like we have less time and less bandwidth to focus on it, but it's kind of like wellness and well-being, which you know is much better than I do, that it's like, hey, I don't have time to focus on my well-being. I don't have time to focus on my wellness. Well, guess what? Once you get sick, you don't have a choice. Right. And in right. some ways, collectively, right, we're sick. And not hopefully most of us aren't actually sick, but the reality of possibly getting the virus is there and real. But culturally, there's a sickness that has impacted us And therefore, what it's requiring of us is being that much healthier in order to address that. Mm -hmm. And so from a team standpoint, you know, this first pillar is about psychological safety. The second pillar is about... Hey, let me me just put a fine point on this question. You asked a beautiful question. And I just want to make sure my listeners get it. It's like, what do you need to feel emotionally, mentally, physically, and physiologically... I'm sorry, psychologically safe. Yes. I just loved it. So I just want to make sure they heard that. On to the second pillar. (laughs) Well, I think, but but then this, it very much relates to the second pillar because the four pillars in the book actually sort of build on each other in general. And especially right now, it's like, if we can create that psychological safety, what comes next is focusing on inclusion and belonging and making sure that people feel included and ultimately that they belong. Again, Maslow's hierarchy, it goes from physiological needs, right? To safety needs, to belonging is the third level before we get to esteem and self-actualization as we go up the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy. So belonging, look, 
we think we think of inclusion and belonging, and, and I write about it in the book in the context of race and gender and orientation and all of these identity aspects, which is super important in general. But if you think about it even at a, at a deeper, more fundamental level right now as human beings, it's like, oh, let's just take the example of, hey, everyone come back to work. Okay. I don't feel safe coming back to work, but I'm, I have to, or I'm supposed to, I need to support my family. I don't want to be a problem. I don't, you know, but, okay, what do I do now? I'm there and I don't feel safe at all. And I'd much rather be at home. And I say something about it. I feel psychologically safe to say something. And now people start judging me. Wow. What's the matter with you? Why do you want something that, you know, oh, now oops, Correct. Yep. I don't feel like I belong. I'm the weird outlier here, just as an example. And it could be the other way around, right? So again, it's not about, we all have to agree with each other. We all have to have the same opinions and beliefs and no, it, it, what it's about is understanding that we have a fundamental human need to belong. We're, we're hardwired to belong. We're hardwired for connection and it's a need. It's not a want. It's not a desire. It's not, that would be nice. It's a need. And so therefore, again, like asking people, what do you need to feel safe? Really thinking about, and look, when, when we think about race and gender and orientation, any identity that we have that's going to have us be, you know, not part of the dominant group, not part of the majority, whatever the majority may be. And in many cases, you know, again, thinking about American business culture, it's me, it's white, straight, male, right? That's not always the case. I mean, I work with companies that are predominantly female, right? Or predominantly this or that, depending on the size of the company or the industry or whatever, but whatever the dominant group is within any, any organization. Well, yeah, because it could be so easy that someone's coming in and they feel unsafe and other people are kind of, you know, right. make in front right. of them and go, well, what's wrong? Or vice exactly. versa. Like, what's, the, what's the dominant the dominant belief here? Again, we think about politics. We're about, what's the dominant sort of generally speaking, you know, oh, I'm an outlier. I'm in the minority of this opinion or this belief or this practice or this race or this ge- age, whatever, right? Fill in the blank. If we're part of the non-dominant group, then the people who are in the dominant group have a responsibility to do whatever they can to try to include people who are in the non-dominant group. Because again, when you're in the non-dominant group, it's harder, it's scarier. And we being included is an important step, but ultimately creating an environment that's less hierarchical and more like, look, we all belong here. And back to what I was saying earlier, some people are more valuable to the team than others just based on their skills. Their, right? That's why like, not everybody makes the same salary for better or worse, right? Because we understand, <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, in some of it's like really a huge disparity between the CEO and someone who got hired three months ago just out of college. But we also understand that there's different levels of seniority and all these things, you know. And, and look, it's, <laughs> ideally it's a meritocracy, but we all know it's not completely. Right. And, and so again, the idea that we do whatever we can, it's not perfect. It's always going to be an iterative process, but for leaders to focus on, am I doing and saying everything I possibly can to have people feel included? Language is super important, but more than language is just understanding. Is there a sense of belonging on this team? And if not, what are the gaps that are creating the lack of belonging and what can I do? And then ultimately, what can we do to make sure that everybody feels included and like they belong? Another great question. Is there a sense of belonging on this team? Fantastic. Yeah. So the, the, so the, the next third... One's, this next one is interesting. I've been curious about this one. Yeah. <laughs> so the third pillar is called, is called Embrace Sweaty Palm Conversations. And this comes from a conversation I had with a mentor years ago. He said, Mike, you know what stands between you and the kind of relationships you really want to have with people? I said, what's that? He said, it's probably a 10-minute sweaty palm conversation you're too afraid to have. <laughs> And I said, what? He said, if, he said, if you get really good at those 10 minute sweaty palm conversations, you'll have fantastic relationships. You'll build trust. You'll talk about the elephant in the room. You'll talk about sensitive issues. You'll, you'll bring stuff up. You'll ask for support. You'll give feedback. You'll receive feedback. You'll get to know people better. You'll work through conflict. He said, look, there's so much benefit to doing that. He said, but if you do like most of us and you avoid them, cause you know, they can be uncomfortable and awkward. And sometimes you put your foot in your mouth and it makes things worse. And people don't always like you or whatever. He's like, then you end up just being a victim of who you work with, who you live with. He said, but if you lean into the discomfort and have those conversations sooner rather than later, and then train yourself, like challenge yourself to get better at them, it'll benefit every relationship you have. And look, here's the thing, Jen, I don't like having those conversations no, any more does. than the next person does, right? <laughs> yeah. They're not my favorite. They're just necessary. They're essential. Like I, I had a sweaty palm conversation last week with somebody and it went okay. It didn't go great. And, and in hindsight, what I realized the issue was why that sweaty palm conversation 
came about and was as challenging as it was is because there were about 15 sweaty palm conversations that I didn't have that led up to that one that we finally had. And then when I finally came to the table, guess what? I was pissed off. I was mad and probably sort of disproportionately mad because I hadn't said stuff along the way. And that's on me. That's not on them. And they were a little bit like, whoa, whoa, what's up? Like, where's this all coming from? And where it was coming from was me stepping over things and stepping over things and stepping over things. And just like, and I'd never had a sweaty palm conversation with this individual. And the nature of our relationship is such that it didn't really lend itself to have it, but I didn't know how to have it. And finally, I just got mad enough that I did. And that's not the most ideal way to have one. And it eventually comes out, like whether it it comes out how it does or it comes out passive aggressiveness, like it's going to come out. Always, every time. It's like it's like trying to keep, you know, a, a a ball under the surface of the water. Have you ever been in a swimming pool and you try to push the ball down and it just like pops up to the surface? Like mm-hmm. that's what ultimately happens. And the further and longer we push it down and suppress it, when it finally pops, it pops with some real force. And we can really damage relationships by not speaking up and not bringing. And what we want to do as a team, and again, because these are hard, if you create a culture on your team where you know what, it's safe to have these conversations. It's okay to disagree. It's okay if, look, not that we want to be yelling and screaming at each other, not at all. But when I work with a team, Jen, and they say, oh, you know what? Everyone gets along great. We never have any conflict. It's all good. I'm always like, "Uh uh-oh, someone's lying. Because there's no conflict on a team. People aren't really telling the truth. There's no way to get a group of passionate, smart, talented, engaged people diverse together Mm -hmm. who aren't going to disagree and like see things differently and, you know, irritate each other. And just like, that's life. I mean, like, again, we're all with our families. I love Michelle. I love (laughs) Samantha and Rosie. We're like driving each other crazy right now, right? But trying to, again, deepen our capacity as a family to like, how do we have conflict with each other and have those sweaty palm conversations in a way that's kind and loving, but real? So what does that look like, Mike, when you think about sweaty palm conversations in the context, in the workplace and with everything going going on? It looks like taking ownership for ourselves, for our emotions, for how we feel, not projecting and blaming other people for stuff. It looks like asking permission. Can I talk to you about something important? It looks like being willing to be vulnerable. And as I say, you know, lower the waterline on the iceberg, if you will. And those are things are hard to do. It's much easier. Look, it's much easier for, let's just say I'm your boss, right? And I'm getting on your nerves by what I'm doing or whatever. It's much easier, even in this crazy virtual environment. We're not even back in the office, but let's say we're back in the office either way, or you start texting someone, we're on a Zoom call and you're like, Mike's getting on my nerves. He's doing that thing again. He's never shutting up. He thinks he knows everything, whatever. (laughs) Maybe all of that is true. Maybe all of those things are annoying things that I do, but it's way easier to be texting or slacking or chatting with someone on the side than it is to come to me and say, hey, Mike. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm upset or I'm concerned or I'm, this is bothering me or whatever, right? Like that's not, easy, especially I'm the boss. I mean, I get that that takes a lot of courage. And in this environment where we're all scared, we might lose our jobs. Like maybe you choose not to do that, but at least we own it like a choice. Because people say things to me like, you can't really be authentic like that with him or with her. Or people don't talk like that around here. Or they'll tell me it's not safe. And I get that. And I'm like, well, why is it not safe? It's not safe because we haven't created it to be safe. We haven't taken enough risks with each other. We haven't challenged ourselves and each other, challenged the norms. And look, these things are hard to do. They're especially hard to do in this crazy environment. They're hard to do when we feel like there's risk involved in doing it. Um, But ultimately, the issue isn't that we can't have these sweaty palm conversations. The issue is that we won't. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's sometimes from a wellness perspective, from a self-preservation perspective, that may be the most appropriate choice for us to make in the moment. It's just over time, it's not sustainable and it's not going to lead us to deeper levels of connection and culture within our teams. Right. And it's also to me all in, all in the delivery. Of course, yeah. there's the, the part where you shouldn't say things, but I mean, they really, it matters so much how you say things. And Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's using I statements. I mean, it's some of the basics we've learned right. in communication training, but really owning it. Like I think I feel, I notice not to be self-absorbed, but it's like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's like, I'm having an issue here that I need to talk about, or I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And I always think if I start from, I, how am I actually feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling scared or I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling frustrated. Okay. And then if the why I'm feeling sad or frustrated, really it's important, but kind of secondary to whatever's going on for me. So if I can own how I'm actually feeling, 
communicate that with you if it has something to do with you or something that you've done, but not blame you or accuse you of anything because you just did what you did. I just am having the experience I'm having. And look, it's hard right now because everyone's at some level emotionally impacted by this, some of us more than others. And then what we're doing that thing is we're comparing our emotional experience to other people's emotional experience, or we're judging theirs or they're judging ours, which is always dangerous territory, right? Yes. It just yes, doesn't I've heard it, I've heard it referred to as the, the grief Olympics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who's, who's got it worse, right? Who's got it? You have no idea. I'm suffering more than you're suffering. It's like, you know, I, I remember years ago, this is unrelated to COVID, but M- Michelle and I were seeing a therapist and he said this great thing to us. He said, you know what? It's at the crux of most conflicts in marriages and most relationships is we start fighting over who's the bigger victim. Mm-hmm. And he said, so what happens is, he said, Mike, you'll get upset about something and tell Michelle you're upset. And she'll say, oh yeah, you think that's bad? Let me tell you how bad it is for me. And you get into this back and forth on who has it worse. And he said, look, I, un- I understand that we all do this. It's just a crazy game to play because at the end of that, if you ultimately win, what do you win? Ta-da, I'm the biggest victim, right? Like you haven't really won, you've lost. So stop having that argument and just start being more real with each other about what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, and I, that has really served us in our marriage to when we do get into arguments and fights, and we do like everybody else does, is to try to get down to the crux of it. What am I really upset about? What am I really feeling? I'm not really upset about the stupid thing we're arguing about usually. Mm-hmm. There's something or, deeper. Right, or even if we can just say, I'm sorry you feel that way. Right. <laughs> just, just say, I'm sorry. I think right. That, and then we, we can't, that's when we start comparing. We can't just acknowledge. The right. Things, right. And acknowledging someone else's feeling that they're having a hard time with something. It doesn't have to mean that our experience is invalidated. You know, like having someone on our team who says, I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm having a hard time or I need a day off or something. Right. And let's just imagine for the sake of argument, if someone says that and we judge it and say, ah, they don't even have kids or they don't even have this or that or whatever. It's like some, how dare they? What are they? Blah, 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 you come in my world, right? That's a normal human reaction. That's just not helpful. And that's not really about them. If that person is struggling, they're struggling. That's real for them. Just because we might judge it and say, I have more on my plate than they do. Like they don't have the right to admit that they're struggling. Like that's again, back to the sweaty palm conversation. If I'm concerned about it, then go have a conversation with the person and talk about it. Otherwise, let it go. Because if we don't and we hold on to the resentment and the grudge or we tell other people like, can you believe what she asked for? Whatever, all that. While normal and human, just not helpful. And it's that whole saying, I love the saying, like holding a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yep. That that phenomenon, and we do that a lot. It's like the only two ways to let go of a con- let go of an issue with another person is to deal with it directly all the way through till we work it out or let it go. Those are the only two healthy ways we can deal with it. The, the way we tend to do it is door number three, which is like, I don't deal with it because it's awkward and uncomfortable or they don't agree with me or see it my way. So I just get mad about it or I tell other people how wrong they are and how right I am. And then it creates this whole vicious cycle of negativity. And then I'm the one that suffers mm-hmm. and it doesn't benefit my relationship with that person. And in a team environment, it makes it toxic. Absolutely. Now I do, I do love the fourth pillar yes. too. I, I, Cause I think it's, it's, it's such a hard balance, but right. go ahead. <laughs> but tell us so, what the, it is. so pillar number four is care about and challenge each other simultaneously. It's right. So what tends to happen in life and for most of us is most of us are a little stronger at one of these than the other. Meaning again, you take Michael Jordan, for example, if you were watching the, the last dance documentary, Michael Jordan is a challenge each other kind of leader from what we saw in that documentary, push, 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 push. And I'm not one to, you know, uh, be critical of Michael Jordan, an uh, incredible champion, right? But it's like what seemed to me from my perspective watching that documentary, what might have been missing a little bit is like, oh, where's the care? Where's the love? Where's the, I got your back thing? And again, I'm using that as sort of an extreme example. And most of us aren't playing in the NBA. We're not playing on the Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan, but it's like, oh, and and on the flip side, there's those of us that are more comfortable with the caring and nurturing and right, pumping people up and you're awesome, you're great, right? Both of those things are important, but we have to do them at an equally high level and not diminish one for the other. Because if we just are focused on the challenging each other, which is necessary, by the way, for us to really thrive and succeed at the highest level, but we don't nurture enough, we can motivate people for a time, but people get burned out. People get defensive. It's not sustainable over a long period of time. If we're sort of over-indexed on the caring, but not the challenging, everyone feels warm and fuzzy. It's all great, but we don't challenge each other. We don't point out when things could be better. 
and we ultimately don't hold ourselves and each other to the highest standard, right? I mean, think about even in a, from a wellness perspective, I know this from personal experience and I'm sure you have thoughts on this. It's like, if I'm going to care for myself, what I need to do for me is have really clear standards and expectations. This is what I do. This is how I eat. This is how I sleep. This is how I exercise. These are the things that I do. And that like ideally all the actions and practices I take so that I take care of myself. Now, inevitably I'm human. So I'm not going to do all those things hundred percent of the time. How do I handle it when I fail? How do I deal with it when I do end up in the pantry at 1030 at night, stuffing my face with a bunch of food that's not healthy for me and I know better, but for whatever reason, I'm emotionally triggered or whatever, and I'm in there and I'm doing it. How do I respond to myself after that? If I have an ability to be kind and compassionate and forgive myself, but learn from it and then recommit, I could be good. But if I go into a shame spiral and, oh, I'm terrible and I'm a loser and what's wrong with me, and then I end up doing that for days and weeks on end because I can't deal with, right, (laughs) which I, I know personally that doesn't ultimately serve me. So even within my own mind, can I care about myself and challenge myself at the same time? And within a team context, it's can we really care for each other? First and foremost, the caring has to come first. But can we also push each other and challenge each other to be our best and hold each other accountable? Part of why we don't hold each other accountable though, Jen, is because we make these unspoken agreements with people around us and our families and on our teams. Like, listen, I'm not going to call you on your stuff if you don't call me on my stuff because I don't really like getting called out but it doesn't serve us ultimately. And the thing is we really love and appreciate when people care about us enough to challenge us. And to your point earlier, it is about how we deliver it clearly. However, most of the time, I learned this many years ago as a coach. I remember when I first started coaching people, my coaching clients would fire me after a certain amount of time. And I was like, why are they firing me? And it wasn't like always they were mad and screwed. It was like, you know, sometimes money or this or whatever the thing would be. And the coach that was coaching me at the time was like, you almost always get fired for being too soft on people, not too hard. And I was like, what? Oh, really? And he said, because look, it's not hard. Like if you're going to be a jerk, that's different. But like most people come and hire a coach because they want to be pushed. Mm-hmm. They want to be better. They want someone who's going to push them out of their comfort zone. And you're over here coaching people and you're being Mr. Nice Guy. That mm-hmm. gets boring after a while. And I was like, oh. but I was scared to push people because I'm like, oh, they're not going to pay me or they're not going to like me or whatever. But I was realizing, oh yeah, that's what they're actually signing up for. And that was in the coach-client relationship. But then I started to realize that like, look, we have to be mindful of it. But in a work environment with our teammates, with our managers, again, you don't want someone to just, they got to build that trust and that respect and and know. I had my, my old college pitching coach, Dean Stotts, was on my podcast last fall and he said his philosophy on coaching for 37 years at Stanford, he retired a few years ago. He said, my philosophy was always simple. It was this, Mike, I got to love you hard so I can push you hard. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and he said, because if, if you know that I care about you, genuinely care about you as a human being, you will give me tons of permission to push you as hard as I need to push you to get the most out of you. But if I don't establish that care and that love, you're not going to listen to anything I say. Well, yeah, when you think about your best leaders, right? The, the ones that you've had, I know I've had are the ones who did kind of take me to that higher level or yeah. know that I was capable of more. Totally. And, and I think we're in that time now too. Maybe it's just a personal thing too. I'm, I'm in my own boat, but yeah. I'm kind of in, in, in the, everyone, I needed to go through my own emotional stuff, my own grieving, all of that stuff. But now I'm like, we are stronger than we think people. Like we can do this. <laughs> totally. We have to be resilient and flexible and teams are going to have to come together to figure out how do we all survive as a team and as a business. Absolutely. Well, and again, it's that, it's that simultaneously you know, being kind, being compassionate, being empathetic, understanding people's experience and what they're going through, trying to look inside other people's boats without being nosy and understand like, okay, they're dealing with different stuff that I'm dealing with. And at the same time, you know, again, I I don't mean to just keep harping on my, my sports training, but it's like, I mean, I was, I was always, and still am, I'm a pretty emotional, sensitive person as just as a human being. And sometimes, you know, it's just like my life can be emotionally messy and I'm sort of, you know, that's just kind of how I roll. And you know what? When it's time to get in the game, you just got to get in the game. Like, I don't care how you feel. Just get out there. (laughs) You got to play. Like, (laughs) it's game time. Let's go. And that is, again, one of the many things that I took from my sports experience that, look, there's a lot of dark sides and all kinds of crazy stuff with sports that I didn't love and can be problematic. But that side of it, I really appreciated. That at some point, we all have to be able to dig deep. And to your point, like, remember, hey, we got more than this requires. And we do need to not suppress our feelings and not just yeah. stuff it down and suck it not up. Like, but there is a point at which feel all your feelings, know what's going on, and still 
get out there and play. And can we do, and that's what caring about and challenging each other is like, we really love each other and we push each other because both of those things are necessary all the time in life, not just in the midst of, you know, crisis and challenge, but especially in the midst of crisis and challenge, we got to be able to do that. Yeah. I really thank you for walking us through those pillars and putting a different, you know, lens over it. I appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. And before we wrap up, I want to, I want, you've, you've given a lot of tangible tips, but I'd like to boil it down. I'm actually going to ask you for two tips Okay, just to be super annoying. Um, if you had <laughs> to give one thing for leaders to do, I mean, obviously you've talked to the four pillars, but let's right. just say one thing that leaders can start right now after they listen to this, um, to go kind of build a strong team, what would mm. it be? You know, I would say two things, actually. First is listen. Constantly listen. Be super curious because, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So listening to your team, paying attention to the moment, to what's happening. Again, great leaders, great coaches understand you can't lead and coach the same way all the time with individuals and even with the team. That's why like leading through this pandemic right now is way different than leading what, three, six months ago. The second thing that I would say for leaders is to ask for as much help and support as you need. Maybe not directly from your team and the people who report to you, but like now is a moment to put our egos aside and put our pride aside and just be as open and vulnerable as we can. We all need a ton of help and support to get through this thing. And I think one of the the dangers for a lot of us as parents, as leaders, as in any positions of authority or leadership we find ourselves in is this notion that we know better, but we forget, especially when we're stressed out, that like it's not about, you know, assuming that we have all the answers and just figuring it out ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, about trusting ourselves and remembering we do have an enormous amount of resilience and strength within us, but it's also about looking for and finding all the different places where we can reach out for support. Because I don't know about you, Jim, but it's always easier for me to support other people with their issues and challenges than it is to deal with my own. <laughs> right? I mean, it's part of why you and I probably do what we do among many other reasons is, but that said, so therefore other people, while they don't know us the way we know ourselves, they have insight and perspective and wisdom that they can offer to us that can actually be even as valuable, if not more valuable than some of the stuff we can come up with on our own. Yes. Great advice. And, you know, where can people find out more about you and your book? Well, the best place to do that is our website, which is mike-robbins.com. And we actually put a special page together for the book. It's mike-robbins.com forward slash together. And that has a bunch of info about the book as well as there's some bonus material that I put together, an audio series and some action guides that are related to the book that you get for free when you order the book from, uh, from that page. Oh, awesome. Well, Mike, I'll link all of, that, all of that up in the show notes. Thank you so much for bringing your wisdom to the show. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there. <laughs>